Well, good morning. Uh, my name's Al. If I haven't met you, we might get to do that later on. Uh, if you have got a Bible there, keep it open at Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, we've got a grand tour, but we will come back here eventually, I promise. Okay, got a little survey for you, so if you're brave enough to put your hand up. Who here is a cat person? Okay, right on, good. Dog person? Yeah, a few more, okay, all right. Can you get a bit divisive about that? Uh, I'm a dog person. Poor old musket, our Staffordshire Terrier died a little while ago. We haven't replaced him yet, but I'll tell you why I like dogs. Every night when you feed a dog, right, they're excited. That lasted cartoon, the dog, one dog saying to another, oh boy, it's dog food again, and the dog's always like that. But from what I can see, a cat... If you have a cat, you're working for the cat. I think that's the case. Now, why do I start with that? I read a book recently, or a little while ago, Cat and Dog Theology, and that is a saying, some people think about God and the, the world, but particularly God like dogs, and some people think about God like cats. Here's what they, what they meant. A dog says, okay, uh, you pet me, you feed me, you shelter me, you love me, you must be God. A cat says, you pet me, you feed me, you shelter me, you love me, I must be God. And what they're saying is different, different ways that you can respond to God and, and what he's done. Okay. Now, uh, the book says, uh, the God-given traits of cats, you exist for me, and dogs, I exist for you to serve you, can be similar to certain theological attitudes held by many Christians. Okay. That's the only message of the book. There's no need to read it. Okay. Um, I bought it. That's enough. Okay. Um, how do you make sense of the world and your place in it? Let me say with um, uh, really carefully, really respectfully, uh, if you're not a follower of Jesus yet, and by it's great to have you here if you're not, if you're not there yet thinking about it, that's, that's great. The Bible says if, you, if you're not a follower of Jesus, you don't actually have a proper view of reality your world view is somehow out of focus because well I'll explain in just a moment but you know even even as a Christian you can you can be I'll follow Jesus but not have the gospel really clear because we can start thinking well why did why did God reach out and rescue me or save me well it must be because you know I'm special or because I'm lovable or because he knew that I would choose him or so we come today to the uh, question of why does God save me? Well, that's the question that uh, Toby's asked me to speak on. Uh, we're working our way through uh, what's called the solas. That's from the Latin word meaning alone. And so over the last four weeks, we've worked through what really are uh, four summaries of the Reformation. Now, the Reformation was an event in history about 500 years ago in Western Europe when those summary statements that we know God or what God wants from us, or what God's telling us about himself from the Bible alone. That we're right with God simply by trusting what Jesus has done, not that we earn it, it's by faith alone. It's only Jesus who can rescue us, Christ alone, and grace alone, it's all about God's generosity. Okay, so they're the four that we've worked our way through. If you haven't been here, you can get on the website and listen to the explanation from the Bible of those four. But we come today to the fifth one, which really ties it all together, and that is for the glory of God alone. Uh, why does God do what he does? It's all about his glory. But let me say, it really does, to understand that, to live that out, really does mean a, a change in the whole way that we see the world. Um, you can talk about it as a, um, what's the phrase they use? The Copernican Revolution. What's that all about? Okay, uh, before the 16th century, pretty much certainly in the Western world, they thought of um, the earth as the centre of the universe or the centre of the solar system and the sun and the planets and the stars all revolved around the earth. We, we were the centre. And then uh, along came a brilliant man, Nicholas Copernicus, um, and in 1543, not long before he died, he published... Um, 
on the revolutions of the celestial spheres. How he worked it out, I do not know, but he worked out that the sun is actually the centre of the solar system and the earth and all of the planets and everything revolve around that. Complete change in the way you see the world and who or what is at the centre. Now, my guess is you, you can kind of work out where I'm going here. If I ask you, who is at the centre of your universe? Who's the centre of your world? Western culture um, values the individual, okay? We're all valuable individuals. Perhaps we could say that together. We're all individuals. You ready? We're all individual. Good, okay. Um, you think, well, that obvious. Every, doesn't everyone value the individual? And the answer is no. Um, in the world today, certainly through history, there are many cultures that value the group or the collective and the idea of an individual having value would be, I'd never think of that. So why does Western culture value the individual? Now, here's a book that really, whoa, this is, this is not a one-message book. I waded through this one. Larry uh, Sidentop has written a book called Inventing the Individual. Now, what's, let me try and give him two paragraphs, what he's saying. In the ancient world, in the Greco-Roman world, they didn't think individual. People uh, were born, they lived, they expressed their religion, their loyalties, etc., and they died as part of a family. That's how they thought of themselves. I'm family rather than an individual. And Siddentop's thesis is that Jesus comes along and then and the Apostle Paul, and they teach that the individual not only exists but is valuable, and the individual has the responsibility, if you like, to choose what he or she believes about God and how they respond in faith. Now, that's a revolutionary idea, but the reason it doesn't seem revolutionary to us is that that's worked its way through the fabric of our society over 2,000 years. The problem, we've moved from the individual is valuable to individualism, I guess you could call it, where the individual is the centre of everything me and my world and what I think and it's, it's all about me. Now, too much to say today so I won't go on about it but here's an example. Uh, Sarah Knight writes, you do you. The strap line there says, uh, how to be who you are, use what you've got to get what you want. That pretty much sums up our world, doesn't it? And not surprisingly, Amazon says she sold three million copies. Thank you very much. Now, if I'm the centre of my world, you're the centre of your world, uh, it's my happiness, is it yours? you can see the potential problems. Now, if I ask you then, why are you here? What, what's the purpose of your life? I don't mean why you're here this morning in a sandstone building, I mean why are you on planet Earth? What's your purpose? Let me take you to a book that... <laughs> As you do you, I cannot think of a book more different to that than this one. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, written around 1647. Uh, you can see they met for something like 10 years, 1643 for 10 years. A whole lot of theologians get together in Westminster in the UK and they, they thrash out the essence of what the Bible teaches. Now... <laughs> It's pretty dense, pretty tough stuff. When I was a kid, uh, my mother took me to a, uh, uh, dragged me along to a very strict little Presbyterian church and um, they had an idea of Sunday school for the kids. Um, and that consisted of after church, which went for an hour and a half and a one hour talk on one verse of the King James Bible. Uh, Sunday school was big old Scottish minister and we had to learn during the week the answers to the questions in the Shorter Catechism. I tried to weasel out of it by telling him that I spent the whole of the week at school trying to learn things and I thought Sunday was meant to be a rest day, so, uh, but that did not work. Anyway, I should have listened because the very first question and answer is absolutely profound. Here's what they came up with. It says this, what is the chief end of man? Now, it's 500 years old, it's before inclusive language, forgive it, please, you know, man and woman is obviously what they mean. 
what is the chief and what is the purpose of humanity? And they came up with this answer. Man, humanity, humanity's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. The reason that we were created, the reason you were created is to bring glory to God. Now, that's the last of the solars. Let me uh, show you what I I want to do now is walk you through four things about this idea of glory and God, okay? The meaning of glory, creation and the glory of God, the hidden glory of God, and then living for the glory of God. Um, Okay, now what what does glory mean? The first thing. Um, Different words, Old Testament written in Hebrew, New Testament written in Greek. The Hebrew word for glory, kabod, or however it's pronounced, um, the root idea, what does it mean? You kind of think, yeah, I get, I get the glory thing. The root idea is the idea of heavy, heaviness uh, or weight, being substantial sort of thing. Uh, weight or worthiness, it's used of people to describe their wealth, splendour, reputation, honour. Okay. 200 times it's used in the Old Testament. And then in the New Testament, uh, the word doxa, the Greek word doxa, it's about reputation, honour, fame, um, something that radiates from the person that has it and leaves an impression behind, 149 times in the New Testament. Um, so the, the glory of God, what, what's it mean? What's it talking about glory? The idea of God's greatness, splendour, honour, power, majesty, you, you get the idea. Um, now, I, I read all the New Testament references, those 150 or whatever it is, um, uh, I was thinking about just kind of reading those Old Testament, New, 350 references. We could just read through all of those and you'd start to get the idea. But I suppose you didn't bring a cut lunch and you want to finish before three o'clock. So here's what it's going to be like. I'm going to walk you through, run, walk, walk you through. You can understand the whole of the Bible from this idea of glory and God's glory. But for the next 15 minutes, it's going to feel like drinking from a fire hose, okay? If, I lo- if you hang on, good. If I lose you, don't worry. At the end, it'll all be very clear and I'll pull some threads together, okay? I've got two of you nod. If, if four or five of you nod, we'll just keep going. So is that clear enough? Okay. Now, probably lose you. I know I've spent two weeks thinking about this, reading about it or whatever. Forgive me. I just can't work out what to leave out, so take a deep breath. Here we go. Creation and the glory of God. You want to understand the Bible? Glory unlocks it. Psalm 19 talks about creation and the glory of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. What's the psalm, uh, the psalm saying? Creation shouts out the glory of God. Now, because we live in the inner city and it's all kind of concrete and electric lights and whatever, it's very easy to lose the majesty of creation. I mean, I wake up each morning hearing beautiful bird calls. They wake me up. It's an app I downloaded for my iPhone and I use it as an alarm. Uh, Yeah. Or did you know, who noticed it was a full moon this last week? Uh, Yeah. Spectacular. And yet... Very often, well, a couple of us notice it. So it's easy to lose that. I won't go on and on about it, but it just, yeah, go to spend some time out in the bush and look at the stars. Or if you're a science type, the more that we learn about kind of molecular biology and how cells work, etc., or quantum physics, the more amazing creation becomes. In fact, um, in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, the Apostle John gets his vision of heaven, of angels and everyone in the throne room of God, giving God glory, saying, Revelation chapter 4, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. Right? Glory, honour, power. Why? For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So God, the, creator, the creation brings glory to God. Not only that, God creates humanity to share in that glory. So one of the Psalms, like a poem in the Old Testament, says this, speaking to God, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the the moon and the stars which you've set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, 
human beings, that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and what? Crowned them with glory and honour. And so humanity, God creates us, what do we, to know him, to bring him glory and to share in that glory. If you like, kind of like reflecting it. As we're created, man and woman, image of God, to care for and manage and look after our world. But sadly, that's not how we respond. So the Apostle Paul says when he writes to the Christians in Rome, um, if we, don't, we don't follow and glorify God. We, well, let me read you what he says. Speaking of humanity, he says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, don't, don't give God the glory, nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and did what? What's the foolish thing that we do? Exchange the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human, uh, mortal human beings, birds, animals, reptiles. He's talking about idolatry, that God is there and great in his glory and we end up living for the creation or we put ourselves at the centre. Now, with all of those, if you like, if you've got everybody in a different orbit with everyone at the centre of their own solar system, is it any wonder there's a mess and pain in our world? And, and the story of the Bible, from beginning to end, is a story of God stepping into our world to fix that mess and to rescue people. So, I don't know if you've read the Old Testament, the story, you know, God talks to Abraham, promises, God calls his family, makes him into a nation, nation of Israel, brings Israel out of slavery in the Exodus, brings, brings them to Mount Sinai and gives them the Ten Commandments. And uh, the thing about the Sinai thing is the glory of God is there, there's earthquakes and lightning and uh, thunder and the people are terrified and you can see the glory of God. But after God gives Moses the Ten Commandments, Moses says to him, you see here in uh, Exodus 33, then Moses said, now show me your glory. And God doesn't say, well, look, here's a lightning storm or here's an earthquake or look at what God says. And the Lord said to Moses, said to him, the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Interesting. When Moses asked to see the glory of God, what does God say? I'll show you my, my character, that I'm good and merciful and compassionate. So it's not just power and creation, it's God's character. And so if you want to go from the Exodus, probably the next 400 pages of the Old Testament in one verse... Here it is, in the book of Isaiah, about 800 BC, God says, I am the Lord, that is my name, I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. In the Old Testament, the people of Israel would not stop worshipping idols, other gods, etc. And it always ended in tears because God won't give his glory to others. Now then you get to the New Testament and we come to the hidden glory of God. I don't know if you can remember how the New Testament starts. It starts with a bunch of shepherds in the dark, and then all of a sudden in, in Luke's Gospel, shepherds in the dark, and then a whole lot of angels arrive, the sky lights up, and what are we told? And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, Bethlehem, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And so they're told the glory of God's arrived, great news. Is going. And how will they recognise the glory of God? They'll find a baby lying in an animal feed trough, a manger. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Not what you'd expect. And so as Jesus walked and lived among people, some of them, some of them could see his glory. So John, um, when John writes his gospel, he says, and the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. 
We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father. What's the glory of Jesus? Full of grace and truth. So grace, God's generosity, and he told us the truth. But not every, some people could see the glory in Jesus' life. So um, the story about the wedding at Cana of Galilee, we're told Jesus reveals his glory as he made 800 bottles of the best wine for this young couple, the bride and groom, so they didn't lose face. Overflowing generosity. Or as Jesus is about to raise Lazarus from the dead, he says to Martha, didn't I tell you if you believe, you'll see the glory of God. But in John's Gospel, hang in there with me, in John's Gospel, the, the greatest display of God's glory is exactly not what you'd think. Jesus talks about his hour, uh, this event that's coming, and you get to chapter 12 and he explains what that is. He says, Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man, that's his way of talking about himself, for the Son of Man to be glorified. What does he mean? He said, very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. He goes on to say, now... My soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very hour. Um, sorry, for this very reason I came to this hour. What's he mean? That he'll be crucified. So in John's Gospel, the way that Jesus is glorified, that God is given glory, is that Jesus goes to the cross. And he'll say on the night before he died, as he prays, he says, I have bought you, speaking of God, I have bought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Meaning what? It's at the cross that Jesus most clearly shows the character of God, the love of God, and is most clearly obedient to his Father. There's the glory of God. It's not, it's very counterintuitive. And so you read on, Jesus doesn't stay dead, he's raised again. But there's this pattern in the New Testament, we'll see in a moment for Christian believers, of obedience and suffering and then glory. Uh, he says it on that, uh, I don't know if you're familiar, the, he appears with two people, they're walking um, out of Jerusalem on the road to Emmaus, they don't recognise him, he explains, he says to them, um, Luke 24, he said to them, how foolish you are. And how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? So Jesus, yep, suffered in obedience and now seated at the right hand of God. And one more thing. The birth, life, death of Jesus, resurrection are all about the glory of God. And Jesus says he'll return and bring the judgment day and judge every person. So Matthew 25, he says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne, all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates a sheep from the goats. And in judging humanity, Jesus will be seen to be just and fair and be given glory. Okay, still awake, still there? All right. Ephesians chapter 1. Let's finally answer the question that uh, Toby said. Um, why does God save me? Right. So living for God's glory. Have a look at Ephesians chapter 1. So this is the Apostle Paul. He's writing to the Christians in Ephesus. And here's where the pronouns matter. Not him, her, she, him. It's us and we and you. Have a look at verse 11. He's, he's writing to Jews and Gentiles. And he's saying the Jewish people were chosen first by God. They, the message came to them first. Have a look at verse 11. Yeah, got it? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. In him, we were also chosen, meaning we, we Jewish people were also chosen, having been predestined, God chose them in advance, according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. In other words, God does everything as he chooses. Verse 12, in order that we, the Jewish people, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be what? Why does God do it? For the praise of his glory. God saved the Jewish people, these people first, so that he would have, be glorified, so that God would get glory. 
Yeah. Or have a look at the next, the very next, and this is why it's worth having a you know a Bible, right? See verse thirteen. So he says we, and then you see how the pronoun changes. Verse thirteen he says, and you, he's talking to Gentiles now, the, the outsiders who are brought in, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of the truth. Yeah, why? Have a look down to verse 14, okay? Why has all that happened? To the praise of his glory. The reason that God saves people, whether you're a Jewish person brought in, right, or a Gentile, kind of an outsider who's brought in, is to bring God glory. It's about the glory of God. You think, why, why does God... I'll tell you why, because God rescuing people through just trust in Jesus, shows God's love, compassion, justice, mercy, and why does God want it? Because it's best for us too. So give God the glory, not only reality, if you like, but it's what we were made for, to recognise that. It's the kindness of God to do this for us. Not only that, okay, hang in there, we're nearly there. Not only that, the promise is, if you'll trust Jesus, you kind of... How do I put it? Almost walk the same path as he did. That's the idea of we'll trust Jesus, we'll be forgiven. There's obedience, there's difficult things, and there will be. And then the promise of glory. See, the, Jesus, obedience, you know, suffering, glory. The Christian believer, the same. Let me show you. Um, uh, 2 Corinthians. Uh, Paul writes a second letter to the Corinthians. He says this Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles, and this is Paul who's been flogged and shipwrecked and beaten and imprisoned. He says our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Whatever it is you put up with as a follower of Jesus, it just it's trivial compared to what the glory that's coming. Or um, the promise that will be physically transformed. What do I mean? Have a look. Um, Paul writes to Christians in Philippi and he says this, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 21, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. The promise is you're a follower of Jesus. One day you'll be raised of the body fit for eternity like Jesus. Uh, let me tell you, the older you get, the better that promise looks. Um, you can't beat time and gravity. Uh, and so older I get, the more I'm looking forward to that. So what's, if you're a follower of Jesus, what's your job? Now's the time. Okay, if I've lost you, you ready? Kind of what day is it? Where I okay, One verse, it's all you've got to do. Here we go. If you're a Christian person, what's your job? Paul says in 1 Corinthians, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. That's your mission. That's who the centre is. The centre of our world, our universe, is God. Now, um, it's possible to live with a completely wrong worldview. Let me, let me give you an example. Uh, I work for the Fellowship of Independent Evangelical Churches. Okay, that's, that's my, my day job, if you like. Uh, what is that? Well, it's a fellowship of independent evangelical churches. Uh, pretty snappy name, really. Um, 56 churches around the country. Okay, so I travel, I speak at different things. I turned up to speak at an Anglican church for an event up, uh, up near Hornsby, and one of the organisers met me and was pretty kind of um, arm's length and not particularly friendly. He said, Al Stewart, I said, yeah, that's me. He said, who do you work for? What do you do? And uh, it turned out he had Googled F-I-E-C, but he'd mixed up the middle two letters and he'd Googled F-E-I-C, <laughs> um, which is Flat Earth International Conference. Um, so I don't mind him being a bit kind. I said, no, mate, those letters, the order really does matter. Uh, so I did a little bit of research myself on the Flat Earth International Conference. Uh, this is Mark Sargent. He is like the uh, spokesperson for um, F FEIC. Um, Wikipedia will tell you um, 
Mr. Sargent also incorporates other conspiracy theories into his flat earth beliefs, um, accusing astronauts of being Freemasons. I'm not sure why that matters, anyway. Um, and um, Sargent also believes Bigfoot exists. Uh, now, oh, so yeah, that's the model of the world. That's what it's meant to look like. The ice caps are all around the edge, I think. Um, they're just living in fantasy land. And I guess you can keep going for a certain length of time. Um, uh, I don't know what they do when they buy a round-the-world ticket to go on holidays or whatever. But um, Now, that in some ways reasonably harmless. What's the Bible saying? If, you, if we live as, with us as the centre, it, it's going to end in tears. And it's the reason why our world is such a mess and why there's so much pain in our world because... It's not reality for us to live with us at the centre. The reason we're made, the reason we exist is to serve God. And so, um, what did that uh, Westminster Confession, what should I have learned from that first question? What is the chief end of man or woman? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Now, God will care for us, love us, mould us, rescue us, yes, because that's his nature, but fundamentally we exist to serve him, not the other way around. And how can we bring glory to God? Look, I've, I've been uh, following Jesus for, I think it's 44 years, and to be honest, I, I'm still, I still struggle with this. It's just hard to reprogram the heart. I have good days, I have bad days, I... But what will it look like to live a life aiming to bring glory to God? Well, it's in the good things in life. And man, there's, there's lots of good things here, isn't there? Um, and the gifts and abilities and success and wealth. It's to acknowledge him and give him the glory and the credit for his generosity and how he does that. And, and in the hard things in life. Well, God will put hard things into our life to change us and mould us and teach us. Maybe you pick that up another time. But it's how we, re if you're a Christian believer I'm talking about, how we respond to the hard things in life will bring glory to God. So yesterday I'm, uh, I'm in the car driving out to Lidcombe to speak at a thing and uh, the phone rings and it's uh, one of my... My closest friends, um, uh, I, I worked with him for 20 years. We've known each other for 34, 35 years, something like that. I love him dearly. He's rung to tell me he's got prostate cancer um, out of the blue. Uh, now, he's a fine Christian man and, and trusts Jesus and, and we'll keep in touch. We'll pray, will God heal him? I, I don't know. Depends what God decides. But it's how my friend responds to that and shows that he can keep on trusting God even in that hard time, knowing that God will ultimately do what's best for him. That's what will bring glory to God. Or some of us will live with heartache thinking there's things that I really want and think I need and God hasn't given that to me and it's, and it's the way you respond to that will bring glory to God. Or maybe, you know, the, the times when you know if you stand up for Jesus, you'll be laughed at or mocked or whatever. And then to go ahead and do that, that's what will bring him glory. But you see the last little bit of the answer? Man's chief end is to glorify God, yes, or man and woman, um, glorify God and what? Enjoy him forever. See, it's the kindness of God to show us this. Why? Because... It's as you glorify God and realise he's the centre and it is all about him, that's when you actually find um, joy and love and freedom and, and life because that's what we were made for. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we ask please that we might all come to know the Lord Jesus, to know the forgiveness that he won at such great cost and to be able to live a life that points to him and to you and gives you glory. And we ask this in his name.